this is Scott, and we're uh, very excited that we've been looking forward to speaking to you. And Ron here, and uh, yes, uh, very excited. We um, have a great project, and we just wanted to get the word out to uh, as many people as we could about uh, what a fun and uh, hilarious uh, show we put together and the great people that uh, came together to help us do so. Yeah. Awesome. I'm interested in, you know, learning so much about this show. I got a chance to I got a chance to see some of you know the trailer that you guys have up and I, I think you posted three episodes on online now and I got a chance to look at that as well and, you know, checked out your Facebook page and, you know, just basically did my research on you guys before the show. But um before we proceed, I I just want to know how do you two know each other? Like, how did you guys get connected to one another? Do you want me to take this one, Ryan, or do you want to do the lead on this? Uh, I'll take this one, Scott. Okay. Uh, I was working in television from '94 uh, to about 2004 at a local LA station that was uh, basically multicultural, but we basically primarily uh, focused on the Central American audience, and we did. Uh, parades and festivals and events um, throughout the year that were aimed at the Central American audience, um, I mean to say, in, uh, in Los Angeles. And mm-hmm. at one point, Scott brought a shopping network to the station, and we started doing a live uh, broadcast at about 6 a.m., five days a week, uh, in which Scott was the Chiron operator, which meant he put the titles up for prices of jewelry and things of that nature. And I was a technical mm-hmm. director, which meant I did all the switching of the cameras so that it would go from the host to a piece of jewelry and back and forth. And we did this uh, for about a year. It was a live show. Mm-hmm. And uh, to entertain ourselves, Scott and I would sit in the booth and tell jokes or sing songs and just do all kinds of fun things, which cracked up the cameramen who were working. And at one point, we both realized that we were – Uh, both interested in writing, and we began writing scripts together uh, around uh, the year 2000 and wrote scripts for about 10 years. Mm. Okay, so you you, you wrote scripts for for television? Uh, Television and film. uh, Primarily, we we focused on writing feature-length screenplays, and uh, we actually optioned one a couple years ago, and uh, nothing ever happened with it, but it just gave Mm -hmm. us the impetus to start creating things for the internet because we realized that with reality television, you know, mm-hmm. getting screenplays produced was a very complicated and very difficult uh, way to try to get into the business. And we realized with the web series, we could do short attention span theaters, you know, three to five minute shows um, mm-hmm. and produce them rather, you know, inexpensively. So that, that became our forte. Okay. So be- before we go into the, you know, cause I'm going to have you guys describe, I, you know, I looked at it. There was a, there was a sort of unique element about the the way that your your web series is shot, and I want to ask you guys to you know kind of discuss that a little bit down the line. But before I get to that, at what point did you guys um, get into um, you know just being aware of the web series space? At what you know when did you guys get into the web series space? Well. Uh, this is Scott. How about if I take this one? One of the thoughts that happened yeah. early on in our relationship as writers, mm-hmm. we were trying to write larger you know, screenplays, and since we found that we weren't able to get an avenue out of that, we mm-hmm. opted to write a, another screenplay uh, that we were going to produce ourselves, but we weren't able to get the funding we needed, and then we started writing some plays. And as right. things changed, the, the business model of – the industry has changed. We saw shows like there was that blog um, bleep. My dad says that turned yeah. into a television series, and I know from just research I've done, all the studios, all the uh, you know major production companies are looking to the internet for right. what's viable. So we thought to ourselves, yeah. why don't we try to use this as a vehicle to try to get something out there? And we came up with a few ideas, and it progressed from an initial seed of an idea, and then we brought in uh, Brad Mays, a wonderful director. Then we locked in and mm-hmm. got some great talent involved, Johnny and Frank. And, uh, you know, Ron and I will go more into that later, but we it kind of coalesced from this little idea, and we got more people interested, and it really got our creative juices flowing. Okay. So, okay, so what year? What year did you start creating web, web episodes? 
This is Ron, and I'll, uh, I'll answer that one. Uh, literally about four months ago, okay, we, started so you guys writing, got, okay. uh, we started writing a, a web series. Uh, I think we had five episodes under our belt um, about two guys who lived in an apartment, and they ran a customer service department for a, a local department store. And Scott mm-hmm. and I were going to play the, the two central characters, the, the lead roles. And it was really just about these two guys. We didn't have any thoughts of adding any characters as of yet. Mm-hmm. The whole process was that we were going to sit in an apartment and answer phone calls, and you would never hear the person on the other end of the phone, so you'd get all of the information from whichever one of us was on the phone mm-hmm. at the time. Okay. Um, we thought it was cute and funny, and... Um, we took it to uh, Brad Mays, who we just mentioned, who is, is a fine director. He directed a film called The Watermelon, an independent film, uh, two years ago. And um, I knew two of the actresses in that, and one of them suggested that I check out what they were doing and mentioned that they needed some funding to get the, uh, the project finished. Well, I saw some okay. dailies, and uh, I went down and saw the last day of the shoot and met Brad. And I was impressed both with his talent and his style of directing, as well as uh, what I saw them, you know, what they had on film. Um, it, was, okay. it was beautifully shot, and um, the director of photography, a gentleman named Larry Malloy, who's mm-hmm. got 20 years in the business or more, and uh, worked on Toy Story, among other things. So he, he's a very talented individual. Um, he just lit the scenes beautifully. I mean, the film just looked beautiful. It was charming. Um, it was comedy, but it wasn't over-the-top comedy. It was, you know, comedy with uh, a love story and, and the whole thing. Um, so okay. I agreed to invest in the watermelon, and um, through that friendship with Brad, um, it led to him being interested in working with me again. And so I, when I brought customer to service, which I don't even think mm-hmm. it had that title at the time, but when I brought the scripts to him, he said, mm-hmm. well, you know what, let's have a read through and see how it goes. But he said, I really think you guys need to get real actors to play the parts and not just, you know, you guys do it. Just the two of you, okay. Yeah, so he said, he suggested that we find or or solicit some actors to work on it. And uh, Scott and I, uh, but particularly me, I had a long uh, friendship with both Frank uh, Noon, who is the, one of the two central characters. Yes. And Johnny yeah. Agostino. Me and Frank go back 30 years, and me and Johnny go back 20 years. So they were both very close friends. Frank has done a num- mm-hmm. number of national commercials, uh, including for uh, – uh, help me out here, Scott. Let's see. Um, let me go over everything here. We've had – well, the, well yeah. one, he was in some Capital One spots. He was actually in a 2-2 in yeah, a Capital One spot that was recently the, on. He played a tooth fairy mm-hmm. in that one. He's played a judge in some Internet stuff that's going to be coming up. He's also going to be coming up uh, in on uh, the, one of the episodes of Shameless, the William Macy series. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, he's done countless other things on television. He played actually one of the more classic Seinfeld episodes uh, with the pig-faced man uh, at the hospital. Okay. So, he also did some okay. national AT and T so, spots. Um, he was in the history of tailgating, which uh, ran like thirteen or fourteen uh, commercials during uh, the football season. So, uh, a fine so actor, did, did. comic actor. Uh, he's also been in some some feature films. And then Johnny has worked uh, in television and cable. He was on uh, episode of Californication. He was also in the Sarah Connor Chronicles, which was on Fox, a short-lived television yeah. show uh, based on the Terminator movies. Um, so, so I want to I want to I want to I want to talk a little bit about your your you guys individual roles. I want to talk a little bit about your individual roles. You went from being in front of the camera to now being behind um, behind the scenes, um, you know, doing you know producing this, this project. What are your individual roles? I mean, I want to talk about you, Ron. Are you more of the, the you know the writer, producer, or you know what are your individual roles right now? Well, Rich, I, I do have an acting background per se. Me and Frank were uh, both co-starred in a in a play that he wrote uh, several years ago, and Johnny and I actually had a uh, cable show back in the '90s, uh, or I'm sorry, yeah, yeah, back in the '90s called Now You Trippin' that we did locally. So you know, I've been on both sides of the camera, but when I met Scott, I was focusing on writing, and uh, so we've been writing partners and and co-writers together. Like I said, for about ten years now, and that's so my main. Who, who wrote the web series? Who wrote the web series? It, it's who, co-written who, by me and Scott, yeah, almost right down the line. Um, we, what we do okay. is we basically will write, send treatments to each other, 
and we'll do tweaks and send it back and forth until we get it to where we both go, yeah, it's good, it's ready, let's, let's move on to the next project. And so we co-write okay. everything so, together, and uh, Brad Mays, the director, said, well, you know, you guys are, it's your project. You know, I'm just directing this, mm-hmm. and I'll edit it for you, but it's your project, so you guys are the producers, so you've got to make all the hard-line decisions about decisions, when we yeah, shoot, yeah. we shoot, you know, who's going to be involved, uh, where the money's going to come from the budget, you know, all of those things. So mm-hmm. me and Scott are the co-writers and the co-producers of Customer Disservice, the web series. Okay. So you, um, I, do you guys have a website? Um, we have a website that we are currently building. Uh, we, ha- we own the domain name Customer to Service through um, GoDaddy, so that website will be up and running uh, probably within the next two to three weeks. So where, where is the website forwarding? Is it forwarding to any platform right now, or is, just, um, it, or is, still, or is it still parked on GoDaddy? Because I tried looking, I tried looking, you know, looking for a website and I couldn't find it. It's so, still part, um, we have a marketing person who is actually uh, building and constructing the site for us. So it won't actually go live probably for about two to three weeks. Uh, but we do okay. all of our uh, promotions and marketing for the show uh, through Facebook. We have a, a large fan base there, okay. uh, about 1,000 people right now. We've had 1,600 views of our series. Uh, you mentioned three episodes. Yeah. We actually only have two episodes up and running right now, and a new episode premieres every Saturday on Stay Tuned. TV.net, uh, yeah. 5 p.m. every Saturday. And I want to talk about Stay Tuned right now. I looked on your Facebook page, and you know, whenever, whenever web series producers get into um, distribution partnerships with you know, destination platforms like you know, Stay Tuned TV and you know, a few others out there, I'm always interested in knowing what sort of um, kind of agreement or you know, kind of like how it's working out. So in this case, I looked on your Facebook fan page and I saw that I'm actually on it right now. You are you wrote there that you're creating it for StayTuned.net. Now, did they who owns this project? Did they finance it, or are they just a distribution platform for you guys to get your work out there? Well, this is Scott. I'll take that one. Um, well, the way that it works out with this particular project that we've got going now. There's a gentleman named Frank Zanka, who's the head of StayTuned.net. We had an initial meeting with him prior to the project being shot when we were in pre-production, and we discussed it with him, and he said he was looking for content for his uh, his his particular uh, yeah, distribution right. base, and yeah. we talked to him. He liked where we were coming from. He doesn't have a lock on us as an exclusive entity, and we're, he doesn't own the show. We own the rights to the show, but he's okay. given us a platform, and we basically help cross promote each other. You know, bring eyes to his site, and he's bringing eyes to our production. So it's it's a mutually beneficial okay. relationship. Okay. So okay. So 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 you own the show outright. They don't. You just have a cross promotion partnership where you're helping create awareness for each other's properties, right? That's Absolutely. The, okay. So, um, and, and you guys are not restricted to to stay tuned. You can you can hyper syndicate on YouTube if you want and other media platforms, right? Or are you pretty much? No, no, that's, that's correct. We can we can market it and produce it and put it out. On any site or any in any way, manner, or form that we that we deem you know will help our cause to uh, to get the show you know recognized and appreciated by okay. as large fan base as possible. Okay, so uh, as far as marketing goes, as far as marketing the show goes, are you guys taking more of the organic approach to where you are building your own fan base, or are you basically depending on your distributor to help put you out there? I, I, this is Scott again. I think safely we could say we are approaching both avenues as well as exploring other ones. As we build a grassroots fan base, just from all the actors and the people involved, they have their fan base. We all have friends yeah. and relatives and business associates, and then we're also pursuing industry outlets. So we're spreading the word about the show, and as we spread it to them, it gets uh, you know distributed to other people. Like if, let's say, Johnny or Frank, one of the actors, mentions the show on their fan pages, yeah their fans check it out and pass it out to other people. So we're, we're, you know, we're getting it like I think a word of mouth grassroots approach as well as using, okay. uh, you know, the distribution base that we have with Frank Zanka. So we're, we're trying uh-huh. to find creative ways to get attention. 
Okay, so okay, so back to the deal with Stay Tuned now. As part of, you know, I was like, what is in it for for them other than, um, because I always feel like in deals like this, someone always gets the better end of the deal, you know. Are they running like pre-roll ads? So are they running pre-roll billboards on your content? No, you know, no actually give- they're not. Uh, for, for Stay Tuned TV, I think it's just a matter of, they need material. They're like a YouTube type gotcha. platform, uh, but they're they're you know they're not as big as YouTube, uh, which is good because it's more intimate. When people come to their site, it's easy to find uh, the project mm-hmm. that you want to view as opposed to going through thousands of countless videos. Um, the searches are much easier. That's broken up by genres and and there's mm-hmm. other uh, very you know friendly user user friendly ways of finding videos on their site. In addition, right, we're bringing right. more eyeballs to their site. So their, their site is growing. They're getting more content. Um, mm-hmm. If it's good content, they're getting you know, a lot of views there. So you know, mm-hmm. it's a symbiotic relationship. We're helping them uh, grow mm-hmm. and succeed, and they're helping us get our no, project okay. you know, out to the okay. public. So as far as uh, you, know, you guys have day jobs, right? You have, you have day jobs. Uh, unfortunately, yes. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, fortunately, <laughs> fortunately, you have day job because trust me, I know people right now who would kill for a day job. Absolutely, but, okay. you're right. <laughs> because you guys have day job. I, you know, I, you know, you know, I consult on the on the side. You know, I I consult on the side. I make my money through consulting. You know, other things that I do. And I always just, it must be hard for content creators to work a day job, full time day job, and also balance, you know, web series production and building an audience and all this crazy stuff that goes with creating the the, the publicity that's needed for your content to actually grow. How uh, how are you guys able to balance working full time day job and at the same time working this web series thing? Well well what me and Scott have managed to do is uh we kind of divided the duties that uh, we both have in our in our partnership, and Scott basically and primarily works on the business aspect. He gets press releases mm-hmm. out uh, to companies. He does mass marketing, mass mailing. Um, you know, he takes that approach to try to you know get people interested in the project that have professional ties that can that can we can benefit from. You know, they're they're bringing you know corporations in and helping us. You know get the kind of exposure that, you know, we feel this project needs. I, on the other mm-hmm. hand, uh, work on promotions and the grassroots campaign. I'm, I'm daily on Facebook uh, uh, signing mm-hmm. on new friends and uh, going to my old friends. I actually started pasting the link to Stay Tuned TV on everybody's wall. Mm-hmm. I did an invitation first, and we have over mm-hmm. 1,000 people invited to the event, which is not a live event, obviously, but they can go mm-hmm. to their computer every Saturday and mm-hmm. go to Stay Tuned TV and watch the video. Mm-hmm. But I found that although people were responding, a lot of them mm-hmm. didn't. They were too, I, I hate to use the word ignorant but, or lazy, but they just didn't seem to go the extra step to go watch the video. You know, they didn't mm-hmm. have the wherewithal to go, okay, I've got to type in Stay Tuned TV in the URL, and mm-hmm. then I've got to go under comedy and find genre, and then I have to find customer to service. So I would, I would post a direct, a direct click and play link right on their profile page. And when mm-hmm. I did that, I did 30 or 40 of those, I would go back to Stay Tuned TV, and I would see our numbers climb by 10 or 20, like instantly. So when I did mm-hmm. the work, Mm. And people would immediately go see the video, and then they would start commenting, oh, this is hilarious, this is great, I've got to share this with my friends. And it just started mm. growing from there. After the first episode premiered on January 22nd, Saturday, um, within a week we had 900 views for our video. And I spoke to Frank wow. Bank at Stay Tuned TV, and, and although he was on the phone, I could tell he had a big smile on his face, and he goes, you guys, you know, this is good. These are good numbers for, for one week. Let's see what happens in week two. Well, we, we right, lost right. Still on the 29th, and uh, as of today, we're up to 16, over 1,600 views. On Stay Tuned. Um, on so, Stay Tuned. Okay, on Stay Tuned. So, um, Ron, I've heard your process of, you know, getting people to become aware of this web series. I want to talk to Scott now about, you know, because Scott, you, you handle the business aspect of this. 
Um, I'm pretty sure you are also the one responsible for trying to get money and sponsorships and, you know, um, you know, and, you know, kind of like, you know, the financial aspect of it. Talk a little bit about your, your, ad, your process as far as like the business aspect of what you do um, to draw attention to this project. Talk about your process as far as like sending emails out and contacting the appropriate people. Talk a little bit about that. All right. Well, uh, part just re realistically, though, just you know, to give you an overview, uh, Ron and I do cross, you know, boundaries of what we're working on together. Like Ron has been instrumental in a lot of the financing for this particular project, and what mm -hmm. we, you know, and also he's also been really extremely helpful in having his connections, pulling in some favors to get people to help us with projects at either minimal or no cost, which has been monumentally. You know, mm -hmm. just absolutely helpful. But what I've tried mm -hmm. to do is there's, there's a lot of industry type people that we would say been involved with as writers when we were looking for representation and things. I built up a big database of uh, different people that I contact when I was, you know, just sending out submissions or queries about work we've done. Well, what we mm -hmm. did was that database that, that I spent hours and hours and hours and, you know, quite a lot of time building and refining. I sent, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I would deal that as a as my base for sending out press releases and things like that, where it wasn't a solicitation, but it was still getting information out without being a solicitation because they don't take unsolicited right, responses. Right. So we try to find creative ways to be able to approach people who can either open doorways right. for us or can at least be a platform for us to get information out about the show. So we, we always try to refine and find new ways to make contact. Yeah. For instance, you know, the the the, uh, the path that led us to Frank Zank and Stay Tuned, kind of like a friend mm -hmm. of a friend, we got an introduction, we sat down, and then that turned into a relationship because Ron and I basically mm -hmm. sold ourselves. And I think that's right. one of the key factors that Ron and I have always had with each other is when we work together, and uh, people can see that our energy and our creativity is very infectious, and that we play well off each other because we not only are we like writing partners, we've been friends for years and years. We we like mm. working with each other, and the only friction he and I have ever had in any projects, we argue over the intent of our characters. We never have any personal disagreements. It's more like, no, the character wouldn't do that. No, the character wouldn't say that. But we always keep it in this level of integrity, and I think that's one of the things yeah. that sells us to people, you know, in anything we do, in any of our, um, uh, the information that we get out, any kind of ideas mm -hmm. we get out, people see that we're like very true to ourselves and we're not trying to, you know, replicate somebody else. So how, how many webisodes have you got planned for, but this is the first season, right? First season we're up this to, is we've got first season. Written. How many webisodes do you have planned for this first season? Well, we have ten that are already shot and that are being edited. We're we're refining the second season, which is going to be eight episodes. But we basically have probably thirty or forty episodes, and at least another fifteen or twenty rough ideas that need to be fleshed out. So the the biggest problem for us is selecting which episodes we're going to use that are going to tie into the storyline that we want to develop. It's not a matter of like, oh, what are we going to write next? It's like, what episodes are going to be appropriate for the story arc? So what has been what has been um, what has been the biggest struggle you know besides the the screenwriting you know, as far as like working on the characters and the dialogue and things like that you know, what has been some of the biggest struggles for you guys and you know and what are you guys doing to overcome that? Well, I'll take this one, Richard. Go on. Um, the problem with uh, with doing a, a screenplay like we were trying to do before was that. Uh, one, obviously, it takes it takes money. It takes finances. Um, it's hard to get money, you know, for for projects. I mean, that's just the bottom line, plain and simple. Um, people yeah. really aren't willing to uh, contribute or you know invest in you know an independent project of this type. Uh, with the mm -hmm. web series, um, it's a lot different. First of all, it's very inexpensive to produce a web series. Um, mm -hmm. But don't get me wrong. I mean, you need money, uh, and you know, you need favors. You need a lot of favors. Um, when we came up mm -hmm. with this idea and we brought it to Brad, and he um, agreed we could do something like this, you know, on the fly and, and for very little uh, expenditures. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it basically cost us uh, an hour of rehearsal time in a studio to get the actors ready and primed because we didn't want to go into shooting 
um, and have these excessively long days uh, because the actors weren't prepared. So we gave them lots of prep time, and they, and they agreed to get together on their own and, and hone their craft and get these characters to where you know, they'd be ready on shoot day. Um, mm-hmm. We called in favors from friends to be production designers, uh, unit production managers, PAs. Um, and don't second forget, we got Stephen Gaines, a good friend of, uh, of Brad's, who helped us with lighting and second camera, who was absolutely instrumental in the wonderful look we got. Yeah, a gentleman named mm-hmm. Stephen Gaines. Oh. He actually came to deliver the lights to us on the day of the shoot and stayed and worked second camera. He actually had his camera with him, and uh, he set up the lights. So he was our DP and our second cameraman. Uh, a gentleman named J.J. Azizian, John, who's an old dear friend of mine, he uh, let us use his house for the location, which was great because it was kind of close to where everybody lived, so we didn't have to travel far. Mm-hmm. And uh, he had a room that was just, even though it was a house, it was a room that we could modify and make it look like it was an apartment. And uh, it was just, it was perfect for what we had to do. So we were very grateful and very lucky there. Um, Stephanie Lair, who was a friend of uh, Lorenda Starfelt, another producer of the show, and also uh, Brad's companion. Um, she was an executive producer on The Watermelon. Well, I was the executive producer on The Watermelon, but she was one of the main producers on The Watermelon, and she really... Uh, was the glue that held that production together. And that was a feature film. So, I mean, she, she has good chops. She knows what she's doing. Um, and she Barry brings a lot to any project and, uh, that she gets involved in. Um, so she Barry had Stephanie come down to help as a production assistant. And Stephanie ended up playing uh, a part in not one, but two of the episodes we were shooting. Um, Gina Nasser, an old friend of mine, I called in, and she was our production designer. Um, mm-hmm. We had several other people play bit parts. Dino Rivera played a, a butler. who He's going to actually be coming up in episode three that's coming up this Saturday. Uh, wonderful mm-hmm. gentleman, a good actor, very funny. Um, he brought a lot of levity to the project. Um, Allie Laura Ray. Vasquez so, played a maid. Uh, Allie Ray, who's a, a huge talent. She has a huge fan base of her own from her acting experience. Mm-hmm. Uh, she played a maid. We're actually uh, revamping and giving her a larger role in, epi- in season two when we start shooting, hopefully next so, month. I wonder, um, I wonder so to how these you. people came together, yeah, and uh, I, I wonder, for, for no pay, they came together and helped us shoot ten episodes in two days, which was remarkable. We had a 12-hour day the first day and a 15-hour day the second day. We got ten episodes complete and in the can. And Brad Mays, mm-hmm. the director, has been editing and putting them together and getting them up, you know, on, on deadline uh, to the Stay Tuned uh, Internet uh, service Platform, so that it yeah. could air an episode every week. And so far, everything's been running like clockwork. So I, w- I wanted to ask you, uh, as far as planning goes, when you set out to make this web series, did you guys have a plan on you know, like certain strategies on okay, this is what we're gonna do, this is how we're gonna this is how we're gonna shape this project. Did you guys yeah, have we, a, we were very a, good a at the minutia. Like that, or did you just or you or did you guys just make it to kind of see what you could get out of it? Well we we knew we wanted to try to shoot ten episodes, Rich, and uh and we knew that was that was a hefty a hefty uh goal indeed. Um we actually got four shot the first day, four out of the of the five that we scheduled. Which uh, and like I said, that took 12 hours. So we had six to shoot the second day, which is, was going to be a bit of a burden, and became even more so when the first episode took about five hours. Uh, the fifth episode from the first day, which we shot on the second day, is the first episode, and uh, mm-hmm. five hours out of the day. And so we were really behind schedule. Uh, but Brad and I and Scott pulled together, and we trimmed down some of the scripts. Uh, Brad did an excellent job of focusing on how he was going to shoot each episode, and he shot them all differently. If you watch the entire series, you'll see that every episode has its own little flavor. They're not all just a stagnant shot of two guys on a couch, but there's some interesting techniques that Brad that Brad uh, brought into play that uh, just makes each episode unique and special in its own way. Um, but we got the, sh- the ten episodes shot, and... Um, and so that's why season two is only going to be eight episodes, because we know eight is realistic. Ten, uh, you know, we... That's, we that were, might be a bit too long, yeah. Yeah, we... we I, I, I always say between... I always say... Mine, yeah. When we I go to with it. people, I always, I always tell them, you know, do six. Just, you know, at least for the start, just do six episodes for your first season. 
Well, we um, eight is okay. Anything longer than eight is a, is a bit of a stretch. Yeah, we were ambitious, and, and, and frankly, it's something we'd never done before. So, you know, we went in, we, you know, we went into the fire, and we learned some lessons from it. You know, some, some feelings got a little hurt because we did, you know, run ex- a, a little over what we had planned to. But everybody pulled together, and everybody stayed, had, hung in there for us, which was, you know, an asset do you, do you have, to us. And, do you have any, do you, have any um, you know, goal beyond just the web? Are you guys um, working on, you know, Possibly a DVD launch, or possibly turning this into a movie. I mean, you know, what are, what other what are the goals that you have beyond just um, just having it online? Well, let me take this one. Um, this is Scott again. I, I actually, you were pretty on target. We are looking to uh, put things together at some point when we get the episodes all done with a lot of the background footage, maybe interviews with the casting crew, just behind the scenes stuff, and put together a DVD. We're also there's a lot of as you watch the series, there's a lot of certain characters and catchphrases and different other things that we you know, are looking at maybe for merchandising down the road because that's a possibility. We're also looking to see if this will solicit some interest. Uh, for instance, if you look at South Park, that started as somebody, uh, Trey uh, Parker and Matt Stone made it as like a video as a Christmas card and gave it out. It got yeah. passed around and passed around and passed around. A studio exec saw it at Comedy Central. They went insane for it and bought it, and we're kind of hoping that maybe this may open similar doorways. I'm not saying we're going to follow that same business model, Mm -hmm. but, you know, Mm -hmm. we're trying to get out there to get attention. If this rolls us over into something where somebody says, hey, I like the way you guys are as writers, I'd like to talk Mm -hmm. to you about furthering this project, or let's try to do this as a series we're mm-hmm. open to a lot of things, but we are trying to get our, you know, get as many directions uh, available to us as possible avenues. How um, how much do you tap your fan base to help shape the your approach towards this series? Cause, you know, because I look at, I think a lot of producers really don't utilize the, the little fans that they have to their benefit. Uh, do you care what your fans think about the show? Do you care about their suggestions and feedback? I mean, how you know? Do you like, do you even tap your fan base to see what they would like to see if they would be interested in a DVD or you know a certain merchandise? Do you, do you guys um, take that approach? Let, let me just jump in on one quick thing. One thing I wanted to say before we forgot another person we wanted to also thank is Barrington Van Campen who did the music. He's our a musician expertise and composer, just wonderful guy. But getting back to your question, uh, we do take a lot of the feedback from the fans, and the biggest uh, feedback that we've been getting are, oh, the episodes are too short, we can't wait to see more, which they're anticipating mm-hmm. what we're going to do next. And if the fans, I mean, a lot of fans are saying, hey, we'd like to see more, we'd like to see them longer, we'd like to see this turn into something as a, you know, a bigger mm-hmm. uh, project, mm-hmm. which, you know, it's it's nice feedback, and I think that helps Ron and I see that there is maybe a market where if we got the right avenue, like a, you know, like a Showtime or an HBO type thing where we had the format to do a, you know, a, a good half hour show, of mm-hmm. this, it could turn into that. I, I think that Ron would agree with that as well. We're, we're also considering a contest where people would tell us their own experiences with customer service, and uh, mm-hmm. maybe we would do an episode based on you know the one that we thought was the most bizarre, unique, funny, unusual, uh, and make that one of the episodes. Just write it in for the characters, you know, and and you know. So that would be part of our fan participation, and thank you to the fans for their support, you know, along the way. Uh, but our fans are very important to us. They they write comments to us. We have had so few negative comments uh, mm-hmm. that um, you know it just it's a blessing that people understand our unique uh, sense of humor and and are, are riding the wave with us. Um, mm-hmm. I actually you posted uh, to all of the people that I had written to on Facebook and said, listen, if you if you think we're spamming you or you are being annoyed by. Um, this bombardment of emails, uh, simply opt mm-hmm. out. Let me know, and we'll take you off the list. And out of 1,100 mm-hmm. people, I had literally, I think, 12 to 14 people ask to be opt out. And they were all very nice about it, but they said, you know, it's just not yeah, my cup of yeah. tea. I'm not interested, but thank you. I'm going to have you expand on that in a minute. But before we get to that, I wanted to ask you, you know, I've I've observed web series from literally when we started doing this thing and you know 
and and I've and I've seen it go from silly YouTube videos to now where it's, we're getting to the point where you can't really even tell the difference anymore between <laughs> you know a television show and an internet show. I mean, the only difference is yeah, you're watching on the computer. But as far as like production goes, I've seen some web shows that are literally up to par with TV shows. Um, as far as like production values, storytelling, um, you know, and all that, um, and, and all the other um, aspects that goes into content production, um, I've also observed um, content shifting from three, two, two, three minute webisodes now to longer form content. What do you make of long, long form web series? Like web series that are like half hours or fifteen minutes long. What do you make of those? Well, we love that because actually, you know, the reality is, Rich, uh, early on, Ron and I did write a sitcom that was a longer format that we were thinking of trying to do as an episodic thing where we wrote two episodes and arced out 13, or, you know, where the whole story was going to go. And it was basically like a half-hour sitcom that I would say, if it was toned down a little, would kind of be bottom end would be maybe a Comedy Central and the high mm -hmm. end type place would be like an HBO or Showtime. I wouldn't say it was mm -hmm. really geared toward you know, network, but we, we've often thought in that format, the only reason that it kind of came about, I think, that we did the shorter format is, again, people do have, as Ryan stated earlier, that there's a very mm -hmm. short attention span with people, and there's so much on there, and it's always better to leave people hungry for more rather than, okay, here's another episode where you're watching, like, 30-minute episodes, and after a while, it's, yeah. the novelty wears yeah. off. So, there's a real danger in losing your audience. Uh, people just don't have the time. I mean, people compartmentalize their time uh, so much these days that, you know, a, a half-hour show, unless it's really compelling and engrossing, you, you're not going to be able to hold an audience that long. And that, that's sad. Yeah. It's sad that people yeah. don't, you know, don't have but, the patience. But, 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 but I, think, I think it depends on, you know, I think it depends on, number one, the goal and the sort of, Demo, the sort of demographic that the producers are looking to reach. And I, and I look at, in my case, when I when I when I set out to create this um, this show, this Rich and Barricade show, I always knew all along that my demographic that I'm making it for people who actually have time to sit down and consume a half hour, one hour show. So I wasn't really, uh, and that's just me per se because I you know I know my audience and I know who I who I'm creating this uh, this Rich and Barricade show for is for people who aren't necessarily trying to sneak in five minutes at work to listen to it. You know, this show is for someone who comes home from work and sits down in front of a computer and consumes a you know a one hour show. So I think that is all there's a market. The point I'm trying to say is there's a market for everything. Okay. There are people who are gonna um you know sit down and watch a half hour show if it's compelling enough or if it's you know that's the vision and the uh, you know the goal of the producers. So, just personally, I, I think that there's an audience for short form co short form content as well as um, long form content. Yeah, and just from my observation, people are kind of gearing towards uh, longer shows anyway. So don't don't miss out on that. It's just um, what I'm trying to say. Right, and you and you make a very good point. You have to know your audience. Um, yeah. Now we we went for the three minute thing because we figured you know. We could tell a story in three minutes. We could we mm -hmm. could get a lot of laughs in three minutes, and we would keep people wanting for more, and, and that's worked for us. Um, yeah. But we could do longer form, and and obviously from a lot of the comments we're getting that you know it was too short, and we we you know mm -hmm. we're crazy hungry for more. We know we could mm -hmm. go 15 minutes, even 30 minutes with the show. Uh, the point yeah. is to have the content there so that you you hold your audience for that long. Yeah. So as far as, uh, and I wanted to get back to the spamming issue. I want to get back to the spamming issue. You know, there's a fine line between feeding content and spamming. I mean, I get that a lot. Where, you know, I've I get bombarded with so much spam and so much email blast. So I spend a lot of my time on subscribing myself from from these people who I'm excited to hear about, but it just kind of becomes too much when I'm getting two or three emails every single day. Um, in your case, you mentioned that you know you kind of experienced that to where some people have had to opt out, and that kind of you know in a in a way, yeah, you, I mean you can't control that, but those are those are fourteen, fifteen people that you could have kept that you've now lost. Um, 
So if you, I mean, how, how are you planning on actually getting your content out there but not losing, losing fans? Well, you know, we lost, literally we lost, I think, less than 1% of our audience. So uh-huh. I'm not concerned. I mean, you know, everybody's cup of tea is different, so you're not going to be able yeah. to keep the, the entire audience. It's, it's just not a possibility. But uh, yeah. you've got to know your audience. You've got to know who you're targeting. Um, you know, you've got to yeah. solicit them in a way that, you know, they'll be interested and not turned off. Uh, so that, mm. that gets back to marketing. You know, you have to, uh, to market yourself properly. Uh, you have to entice people. You have to pique their interest. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, it's just a matter of filtering. You go, you go through filters. Uh, Facebook great, is great for that. I know that there's a, certain audi- there's a certain type of person that will like this show, and their friends will like this yeah. show. I, I yeah. specifically target them, and I try to avoid people that may not have my sensibilities. Mm, okay. So um, the name of the web series is Customer Dis. Service. They're currently working on their website right now, but um, you know, if you guys are interested, it's a comedy, right? This is a comedy, Scott, right? Absolutely. Uh, well, at least we we certainly hope it is. <laughs> that that was what the direction we were going. But it started I, I, out that I, way, but I, it, it may be a tragedy before uh, before the story completely unfolds. We'll have to. Well, we'll well, have to how, how, I, wanted ask, I wanted to ask you. Comedy is probably, you know, if the viewer is watching at home and they're laughing and they're having a good time, but it's one of the most difficult genres to write, you know, how do you guys, um, what are some of the tips that you guys can give to com- people out there who are looking at writing comedy? Because it's a very difficult genre. It either works or it doesn't work. That's just the bottom line with comedy. It's either funny or it's not funny. You know what how, how are you guys able to make it work for you when you're getting all these laughs and all these people interested in your, in your show? Well, you know what I think? One of the things that Ron and I have always prided ourselves on, because we do write dramatic pieces as well and co- comedic pieces, but I think mm-hmm. Ron and I, we always have this very set standard. If, if we don't think it's, it's funny or we don't think that the characters have depth and dimension and some level of reality to connect to them, they're, they're flat and you don't relate to them, and we do try to make our characters relatable, even in the absurdest situations. We have to have it where yes. you know a guy yes. who's like that, or you've heard somebody, or you can believe somebody would say that. We try to really base it in reality, and then the final judgment really is, if Ron and I don't think something's funny, or if one of us thinks mm-hmm. it's funny and the other one doesn't, we try to tweak it mm-hmm. because we understand where the person's going with the joke. So yeah, yeah. We, really, we really try to be aware of that, and we're, we're both really good filters for each other. If I have an idea and I don't have it refined, Ron can help me mm-hmm. refine it the same as with him. If he has a problem with, I know this scene will work, but I just can't get it right. Here's the problem, and then I'll say, oh, great, I have a solution. So we try to keep it yeah. true. I think that's the, the main objective we have. Yeah, and when we okay. write scripts, I mean, oh, we'll yeah. go back and forth uh, several times uh, before we say that, you know, it's ready, you know, it's good. Mm-hmm. Um, and I might read a joke three days later and say, you know, it it really doesn't work like I thought it did three days ago. So, I mean, you're mm-hmm. always constantly going over your material and trying to make it, you know, the best it can be. Uh, and it's a process. Yeah. Um, it's nice and having a partnership because you can bounce things off each other. It's harder, I think, for one person to do it because, you know, he has no – no perspective other than his own. So I think, uh, yeah. you know, in writing anything, uh, uh, you know, it's good to have somebody that you can work with that has your sensibilities. But if you're doing it alone, yeah. you know, you just have to send it out to people and hope that uh, that they can give you some some good constructive criticism if if you're missing and and tell you when when you, you know, when you're spot on with what you've done, what, you know, what you're trying to accomplish. Yeah. So so this this is a character driven. Just from my, from what I've seen, is a character-driven show. I like that the, I like that the characters are real. They look like real people, like someone that could be your neighbor, you know. That's scary. Um, isn't it? <laughs> and, and that's one of the things that stuck out when I saw this, because most most web series out there, you know, everyone is trying to do Hollywood, and, everyone, and there's, there's nothing wrong with doing Hollywood, but you rarely see web series where the characters are like literally could be your next door neighbor. So we were very fortunate. Is this something that's intentional or it's just or did you just pick people that were available? 
Um, you know, in a sense, it was people that was available, but more than that, um, I know these guys, and I've seen their performances in, in other, you know, aspects of their work. And so I, I, I can write for these guys. I know what words would come out of their mouths. I know what their expressions would be like in response to something that was said to them. Uh, so it was mm. easy to go to these guys and say, I want to put some words in your mouth. Let's see how it works out. Um, when we had our first read-through with, uh, with Brad Mays and Lorinda Starfelt, again, the director and uh, one of the producers of the show, um, mm-hmm. they were laughing out loud at some of the lines. So we knew, Scott and I knew that we had written something funny, uh, but we also knew that it was made funnier coming from these two, these two professionals, these two wonderful mm-hmm. actors, uh, Frank Noon and Johnny D'Agostino. I also left out yeah. one of our actors, Eric McCoy, who plays a, a very, uh, very good role in one of the episodes coming up uh, in a couple of weeks. Um, Eric's mm-hmm. another old friend. Uh, and it's good to have friends, you know, that are professionals that, you know, will show up on time, that will give mm-hmm. you 100%, you know, when they're, when they're performing. And that, that was a big part of it for us is that we brought a community together, uh, but it was a community of friends for the most part, and uh, they all came through and made this project special. Mm. One, last, one last thing before we go, and I'm going to make this the last question. You know, writing, screenwriting really fascinates me because I'm a screenwriter myself, and I have my own process on, you know, how I go about writing. And I'm always interested in learning how other writers approach their writing. You guys are writers. You've been writers for many years. You have experience in that field. Um, just briefly explain your writing process. And what I'm kind of getting at is, do you write from the perspective of, like, do you actually put yourself in the bodies of this character and write what they would say, what they would, you know, what is your process? Do you write from the perspective of the characters, or, you just, or do you write from the perspective of just the screenwriter? Well, let me take this one. Um, it's funny because Ron and I, our, our writing process has seriously evolved over the years. Initially, when we started, we'd always sit in the same room and write, and we would walk through the characters and do the physicality of it. And Ron kept beating this into my head for like three years. Stop thinking like a director and just only think like a writer because I would be directing it as I was writing it. He said, be a writer, be a writer, be a writer. So it took me a while to get that into my head thanks to him. And then after mm. a while, our schedules got altered and skewed. So we still try to think how the characters was, would speak. But if we know our characters, like Frank and Johnny, who we know, it's easy for us to write the words that we know how they'll sound coming out of their mouths. But then we mm. had different job uh, time frames. So what we would do is I would write a scene or Ron would write a scene. we talk on the phone all the time about what we were doing, where we were going, we would send the scene to each other, then the other person would tweak it, make the alterations. We'd talk more on the phone, send it back. And so our, our process is we've worked kind of individually, but we work together at the same time. So we've tried to, whatever way we can work in a flow, whatever thing changes, mm-hmm. we always find a way to evolve our style so we can always write together. And the funniest part, the last thing I wanted to interject was there's so many times where Ron or I will say to each other, oh, I love that line. And the other person will say, oh, you wrote that. And I'll go, oh, I did? I thought you did. We don't even remember where one of us starts and the other one ends sometimes. We, yeah. You know, we forget who writes what lines because we're so immersed in each other's writing styles. Yeah. So, um, Ron, do you want to add to that, um, your writing style? I, I think um, my writing style is basically um, whatever I think is true to the character. Um, once we establish the character, and Scott's really good at that. Scott's good at set up, um, figuring out where the story is going, giving us a story arc to follow. Um, I'm more into what words would come out of this character's mouth, what rings true for this character to say, whether it's comedy, drama, mm-hmm. suspense. Um, I am always want it to sound like the character is being true to himself or herself. Um, and okay. that's a, thing is writing writing parts for women is very difficult for men because we don't think like women uh but me and scott right, right. Uh, managed to get in touch with our feminine side and so our, our female characters are often uh very you know very thought out and very worked out so uh you know it's, it's a process and um but yeah I, I try to write for the character from the heart uh in the way okay. that i think the character uh is best portrayed 
or best, uh, you know, relates to the audience he's trying to, to talk to. Okay. I'm on the phone with Scott Weitenfeld and Ron Williams. They are the producers of um, the, web, the comedy web series, Customer Disservice. Okay, you guys, they're still working on the website. Before we go, what is your Facebook handle? Facebook.com forward slash what? Um, you can find me. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> you the show. The, what is the Facebook handle for the show? For is the it show, customer, um, dis- forward slash customer disservice? Yeah, just, uh, yeah, just search customer disservice, and um, it will come up as customer disservice web series. Um, mm-hmm. And it's under slash one seven one zero eight zero one. You're not gonna remember that. <laughs> no way. Hey, you know they're not listening. You know, get the website. That's why the website is important. Go to that on Facebook, <laughs> and if you type in search customer and the word D I S S hyphen service, it brings service. up customer disservice. Okay, so Facebook. Okay, go to Facebook, search customer disservice. You can go to YouTube or you go to StayTuned.net, Right? I don't want to get it wrong. We're yeah, stay tuned TV. Dot net. TV. Stay tuned TV. Dot net. And that's stay tuned TV. Dot net. They have, they have a show on there as well. Uh, I wish we had more time. This is an hour. And, you know, I want to thank you, Scott and Ron, for coming on the Rich and Barry Kent Show and um, discussing this web series. I look forward to more episodes. And for those who are interested in, um, you know, learning more about the show, you know, you know, the quickest way to find it, you can just go to Google and just search customer disk service, D-I-S-S hyphen S-E-R-V-I-C-E. Um, Scott, you know, I, I hate to let you guys go. This is a great conversation, but uh, we got to go. So I really appreciate you guys coming up the show. Thank and I look forward to, uh, you know, uh, keeping up with this program and seeing what you guys do with it. Well, thank you, thank Rich. You. And uh, my last words are big ups to Frank Zanka and Stay Tuned TV for launching us and getting us out to the public. And uh, we'll be looking forward to seeing what you're doing in the future as well, Mr. Mbadaket. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for coming to the show. Take care and good luck with the program. You too. Piece and cake, baby. Again, man. We really appreciate the format that you've given us to speak. So uh, have a great day, and we'll be looking forward to uh, checking out your site even further. All right. Awesome. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye.